Uh, look forward to many other times seeing those bright shining eyes. I don't know if you realize this, but if you, uh, like me, have said yes to the plan that God has to save all of humanity, according to what he said to Nicodemus that night, remember what he said? For God so loved uh, only those from Michigan. <laughs> no, they don't really believe that, although us in Ohio, we thought that they did. For God so loved only those from USC, because those from US, UCLA just don't think that those from USC exist. No, for God so loved the world, the whole world. This is what he tells, this is what he tells Nicodemus. And if you accept that in your heart today, then my friends, I have the best news ever. God has granted you, because of what Jesus did, he has granted you eternal life. Oh, really? I, I could say, Big Blue won the... And you guys would be like, yeah! But I just told you that even if you die, God has promised, Jesus has promised that you will live again and that you will never die after that. This is best news ever for humanity. And I have it on good authority that based on this understanding, we can say that the baby dedication we just had with Sean is part of his eternity. Now, right now, he is learning from mom and dad. That's why I said what I did concerning the fact that we as a congregation, we as an extended family get to now uh, help Sean to know Jesus because to know Jesus is to have eternal life. And the fact is that I think every last one of us would like to say, I don't care if I die because I know I am going to live after that and I'm going to live forever. So I like to, I, I, you, you can imagine that I like to ask naughty questions. So if you believe this today, I get to ask you the question that you get to ask all your friends who are also believers. So, how's your eternal life going? You see, because what we just took part in is part of our eternal life. It has value, it has meaning, and it's always going to be remembered. Okay, so you're asleep, you didn't have enough coffee. I'm sorry we didn't serve coffee this morning. Okay. I just told you that everything that has happened already in your life, if you are part of Jesus' family, is going to be part of your eternal life. And those memories that we're making right now, they're all going to be forever. This is, this is maybe disturbing to some of us. Maybe you're saying, I hope that some of my life God forgets. Good news. He promises he forgets all of those things for which we ask him forgiveness. He says, I'm going to take those memories and... From my, this is God speaking. I'm going to take those memories and I'm going to throw them into the depths of the sea. I'm going to forget about it. I like the, you know, the New Jersey. Forget about it. I'm a forget. This is the Godfather. Forget about it. I, th I thought you were going to kill me. Forget about it. So I just wanted to buoy up your spirits this morning because the the story that is part of a series that we have been doing here at Santa Clarita is dealing with the fact that God uses various, various things in our life to shape us. So if you, if you like, you can think of a, of a, of a workshop and maybe it's, it's granite, maybe it's stone or clay or something, whatever it is that you want to imagine that God is using to shape us. 
So this is the last in the series. You see in your bulletin that there's kind of a review of the weeks that we have had together these last six weeks. And this is the last uh, uh, tool, you could say, that we are going to be discussing that God uses to shape us. And that is one that fortunately for uh, the Brian Huerta family has been taken away in a way that, that we all long for and that we are so happy for for them. They, as a couple, are no longer alone. And baby makes three. This is why when my wife and I got engaged years ago, we uh, <clears throat> decided that the next question people were going to be asking us for sure was, when are you going to get married? Okay, and then you get married, and then what's the next question everybody asks? So when are you going to have a baby? Okay, so I know this question has been asked to, 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 to Brian a lot by, you know, some people who love him very much. And, and he has said, Terry is busy. She's getting her education. She's starting her practice. Okay, and so they did like Chris and I did, only a little longer actually. We waited seven, they waited ten, okay, from the time that they've been together. And so this is actually something that a lot more couples are doing. And so people who ask that question, which really talks about this progression in humanity of, okay, when are you are getting married? Okay, now you're married. When are you going to have a kid? Because we, we, we have this built-in piece in us that says, we should not be alone. And so there are times, there are times when we do feel alone. And in fact, what I am suggesting to you today is that God uses this feeling of loneliness as a tool to shape us in our lives. Now, it might be that you just feel alone even when you're in a crowd because you don't know that you can find too many people who think like you. Or maybe, uh, I can honestly uh, attest to this one, you come from a different place on planet Earth. And so now that you're living in the United States, you don't find too many people that come from the place where you came from and, and understand part of the culture that you came from because now you're an immigrant and in fact the US government for many years uh, referred to me as an alien I had a resident alien car along with all of the others from Mars and Jupiter and Venus <laughs> uh, no it's it's you are considered and not from around here which is what the old boy said to me down in Virginia Chaw between lip and gum, hands tucked into his overalls. When he heard my accent, he said, you ain't from around here, are you, boy? <laughs> that, is, that is actually, for me, being, being this, this theme in my life because of the times that I have moved to different places. You can imagine, of course, being an American in Canada. You ain't from around here, eh? Yes, yes, you feel a bit like an alien. So you can imagine the story for today is, is you can invest, you can invest this story with a huge, huge amount of loneliness and watch how God uses it in the life of Elijah. Now, we don't have time, nor am I going to take the time to tell you the entire story. Again, we're going to touch the highlights. You do have a situation here in Israel where Ahab has married a, a, an alien. Uh, he has married a princess from another country, political alliance. But she does not serve the same God that he does. And I'm not just talking about you know, different denominations within Christianity. I'm talking about the fact that she was the priestess of Asherah. Ashtaroth. Asherah, either way. He marries her and does not keep his own religion, does not keep his own God, and in fact allows her to 
lead the people of Israel into the worship of Baal, which was symbolized by a calf, and Ashtoreth, which was symbolized usually by a tree pole. Now, because we are a G-rated audience this morning, we cannot go into the details of this religion because of its highly sexualized content. But I'll leave it to your fertile imaginations that when, ah when Ahab was sitting on his throne and Elijah walks into his, his throne room unannounced and tells Ahab that there will be no rain, hint, hint, pun, pun, sky god, mother earth, there was to be rain that happened between them in order to fertilize the crops. Am I painting enough of a picture? And that the worship service was an inducement for Baal to get with Ashtoreth so that there would be crops. So we're going to do in church what we want Baal to do with Ashtoreth. So this was the religious scene in which Elijah, who serves the creator God, the God that had brought Israel back to its roots, to the land that God would give them, and he is now chosen by God to basically say, what you are doing, A, is wrong, B, is not going to work. You are not going to be able to get Baal to do his thing with Ashtoreth for the next, or until I say. There will be no rain. He goes and hides. God feeds him. You remember the ravens? I was at Sunshine Canyon. Raise your hand if you know where Sunshine Canyon is. Oh, good. Yeah, Nellie, you better raise your hand. Sunshine Canyon, my friends, is the place where they take your garbage. There were quite a few ravens there and, and or crows. We don't get as many ravens, but there were quite a few crows around uh, there yesterday when I went with a friend to pick up a truck tire. That's why we were there. And I'm thinking to myself, and Elijah was happy to have, instead of a drone delivering his food <laughs> to him, he was happy to have these big black birds fly in with some sort of cakes that they, they may have stolen right off of Ahab's table. I don't know. But have you ever thought, where did they get the food that they brought to him? Was it fresh? I hope so. But God protects Elijah and he hides in plain sight. He cannot be found until finally he reveals himself to the steward of, Abraham, of Ahab, Obadiah. And Obadiah says, oh my goodness, uh, uh, I am not, I am not going to go back and tell Ahab that you are here because he will kill me because for sure when we get back here, you're going to be gone. Ahab says, no, I'm not going to be gone. I'll be right here. And so they meet. And these famous, famous words in Scripture are said. So there you are. What? You troubler of Israel. In the political scene of those days, which was entwined with the religious scene of those days, you, 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 have, you have Ahab and Jezebel leading out in one religious cultus, and you have you have. Elijah leading for God. And so now there needs to be a showdown. And this is all under the direction of God. And he, he says to Ahab, get all the people and all the prophets of Baal and bring them to Mount Carmel. This is what happens. And there is a setup for a choice point. 
with all the elections that are coming, there's going to be a lot of choosing going on, right? So it's, this is one of, these, one of these choice points. And he chooses to let the prophets of Baal go first. What do they do? Well, they practice their religion. They take a calf, they, they kill it, they put it on an on a altar, and they beseech their God to help fulfill the requirements of the contest. And the contest was, who's ever God sends fire down on the altar, wins. Well, the neat thing is that about the time that Israel would have been doing the evening sacrifice, this is a very special time in the day, there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. At the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah basically calls a halt to the frenzied dancing and craziness that was going on with the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal, and he says, it's my turn. He builds an altar in the way that they had been instructed by God to build an altar with 12 stones. Each of those stones represented one of the tribes of Israel, the whole family of Israel that was 12 tribes strong. And he builds this altar, he puts the wood on top, he slaughters another young calf and puts it on top and then he says that's not good enough. I want these people to know that there is no trickery here. There is nothing that I am going to do in order for this to happen. And he builds a trench around it, a moat, and then he puts three times, he puts water on top of the sacrifice. As he prays, he prays that God will reveal himself to these people so that they will know who it is that sends the rain. He finishes praying, and immediately the fire falls. It's an incredible scene, uh, and, and one that you would think Elijah would remember for the rest of his life. He does something that, that sounds somewhat genocidal next, but this is war. 450 prophets of Baal, not one of them escaped. He takes them down to the river and they are they're exterminated. As part of this battle between these two religious groups, you could say the victor was able to take out the loser. Again, uh, I tell young people all the time, when you read the Bible, be prepared for the fact that there's going to be a lot of things that maybe your mom wouldn't want you to know right away, but at the same time when you realize what was actually going on, you realize that this is truth, this is reality, and this is what has to happen. Elijah gives instructions to Ahab, go and eat. He eats. While he eats, Elijah prays, and he prays diligently, God, you promised you would send the rain. You would, you, you would send the rain. This is what these people are waiting for. Seven times he sends his servant up, and seven times, and six times he comes back, and the seventh time, as you remember, he comes back and he says, there's a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah jumps up, and he runs down to to Ahab and he says, put your stuff together, rain is coming. And actually he, was, he, he, he wasn't even hardly quick enough because the Bible says that black clouds started coming in over Carmel. I have lived in that part of Israel. It's Carmel, it's near to the main town of Haifa. And there are not that many times when there are onshore breezes. But this onshore breeze brings rain. And, and the Bible, this is, this is, this is where... Elijah and David and Samson come together. The Spirit of the God, I believe, possessed him at that moment, and he, the Bible says he picked up his cloak and his 
lower garments so that he could run. And if you get your Bibles out, some of you have Bibles like this, there's a little map in the back and you can see where Carmel is in the north and you can see where Samaria is, which was the capital of the, uh, the empire with Ahab. And he runs from Carmel to Samaria in front of Ahab's chariot. It's a long way. I saw people this morning, they're, they're practicing for the Santa Clarita Marathon. They've got their bottles on and they've got their special outfits and, and they're practicing, they're practicing. He runs at least a marathon in front of the chariot in heavy, heavy downpour rain. I'm telling you all of this because of what happens next. That's 1 Kings 18. Now we turn the page to 1 Kings 19. Because you see, he's now back in Samaria. He doesn't go into the city. He doesn't feel comfortable there. He's a country boy and he wants to stay outside. He stays outside and a messenger comes to him with this message. As surely as you are alive today, I am going to do to you what you did to my prophets. Signed, Jezebel. Now what has just happened? Fire has fallen. He has run under the power of the Holy Spirit, at least a marathon. And this one message comes to him. I'm going to kill you. You killed my prophets. I'm going to kill you. He's threatened. He and his servant turn tail and run down, look at the map, down south to Beersheba or Beersheba, depending on how you want to say it, at which place he leaves his servant and runs another two days into the desert. And that is where we find him, where Brian was reading, underneath the broom tree. He is begging God to take his life. You could say he's depressed. You could say he's suicidal. No, Jezebel's not going to kill him. He's asking God to kill him. I love what happens next. An angel wakes him up, feeds him. Now, I don't know what kind of food it was, but it says it was bread. We can say maybe it was bread from heaven. Maybe it was a forerunner, or maybe it was extra manna cakes, or I, I don't know. But it's bread and water. Doesn't the Bible promise us, friends, doesn't the Bible promise us that your bread and water shall be sure? Yes. Well, it was sure for Elijah, brought sometimes by ravens, sometimes by angel. But he wakes up, he eats. He is still so exhausted that he lies down and sleeps again. Then the Bible says that he gets up and this time he goes, and, and, and here's where you can, you can either go with me on this or not. He goes for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to definitely lean on the metaphorical here. He goes on a long journey. We don't know if he ate again. But he walks the rest of the way to the mountain of God, Horeb. And that's where we find him. That's where we find him. If you take your bulletin, I, I, I ask Amy to do this for me every week, and she, she comes through like a champ every week. She comes through with a, with a good picture. We find him in a cave. Now, what what has just happened now, what, a month, six weeks earlier? Fire fell from heaven for the first time in recorded history. Well, maybe not. Abel, Cain, I think they had that too. He runs under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he runs and runs and runs some more. 
What on earth is he doing in that cave? That's the question that God asks him in his depleted state. What on earth are you doing in this cave? God decides to, to remind him of how he likes to communicate. And so he sends the wind, and it's a tornado, and it just bashes everything up. And he's watching. In that picture there, you can see him watching from the mouth of the cave, and the wind is going by. And you know what God says? I'm not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake. We'd know about that in California. And it was a big earthquake. He's in the middle of the desert, and it's, and it's shaking, and the rocks are falling. And he says, I'm not in the earthquake. This is not me. Then there's a fire that goes through. We know, we know so much about that. Here we don't like earthquakes or fire. I'm not in the fire. He comes and he surrounds Elijah and he says, I've got a mission for you. And in a still, small voice, the Bible says, I want you to go find your replacement. What? Are, are you done with me, God? No. God is saying, guess what? You are lonely. You are lonely. You need somebody to go and do ministry with. You need somebody to, to, to tell about the way that I have led you in your life and, 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 and the blessings that that has been. You need to be together with someone who is also going to do ministry with you. God gives us loneliness, I believe, to, to, to strip away the misconceptions that we may have of him. He's not in the fire. He's not in the earthquake. He's not in the big, big tornado wind. These are metaphors, you could say, to the things that we see around in the world today. And we say, oh my goodness, what is God doing? Have you ever thought that maybe it's not him? Maybe, maybe he's saying, I'm not in the wind. I'm not in the fire. This crazy stuff that is going on over there, that's not me. But I've got a mission for you. I want you to go and find some people for me. I want you to go and be a certain kind of person for me. I am going to be with you always. Maybe, maybe he uses loneliness to help clarify, to help clarify the mission that he is wanting to send us all on. No, it's not that. No, it's not that. It's this that I want you to do. See, I, I, I'd like to say to you today, God uses loneliness, I believe, to send us back to community. Elijah had been with the people of God, and then he had run away from them. God says, no, 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 no. I want you to go back and I want you to find Elisha. I want you to throw your mantle over him so that he knows that he is going to be your Padawan, your, your uh, mentoree. And you are going to walk around Israel together for a while, and then I'm going to come get you. Genesis. Genesis says that God gets together with himself and decides to make humankind. He says, let us make man in our image. And he uses plural language, our image. And don't forget, gentlemen, that he's created male and female, created he them. And as a result of, of the male and female thing, there is recreation. There is the possibility of procreation. So we celebrated that this morning, did we not? Another human being is here because of the design that God made at creation, 
male and female created he them in his image. And as he goes through this process, we notice that, a a that Adam, Adam is feeling alone. And God takes a piece of him, you could say he reshapes him. He takes a piece of him and he makes Eve out of a rib so that Adam declares she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And now if we had to check Sean, he would be bone of his parents' bone and flesh of their flesh. We know this because we're so cool with DNA, right? He's connected to all of you that are sitting with us today because you're his ancestors. Aren't we so interested in that today? But if you go back to our original parents, you have God saying, you know what? It's not good for Adam to be alone. And that's why he creates a mate for him. And baby makes three. <coughs> My friends, God has a harmony that he would like to bring back to this world. In order to sing harmony, you need more than one voice. He is he is inviting us, my friends, he is inviting us into his family so that we can sing harmony with him. Elijah just needed to be reminded that even when the evil Jezebels of this world threaten to kill you, that you don't need to be afraid of the dark. You don't need to be afraid of the loneliness because God is going to use that he's going to use that to remind you that he is the one in charge he is the one who has the future in his hands he is the one who will use that loneliness to shape you into who you need to be so that he can then send you on a mission and that's the end of the story of Elijah except for the fact that he crosses that river having flicked it with his, his cloak. Isn't it cool? I love superheroes, and Elijah's just one of those superheroes. He flicks the river with his cloak, and the river opens up, and he and Elisha walk through the river on dry ground. And then he's there with Elijah when the horses and chariot of the Lord come swooping down. Again, this is fantastical imagery, is it not? They come swooping down and, 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 and go right between Elisha and Elijah. And Elijah goes up into heaven. And Elisha is, my Lord. And down from the chariot floats Elijah's cloak. This symbol of God's love and care for Elijah and his, and, and his power that shrouds shrouds him, shrouds his humanity in divinity. And down comes, down comes the cloak, and Elisha picks it up, and he knows now that because he saw Elijah go into heaven, that the, the wish that he wished to Eli Elijah will be granted, that he would have not once, but that he would have twice the amazing life that Elijah had. So yes, my friends, from the mouth of that cave, Elijah turns around, he listens to God, God sends him on a mission, that mission ends as a flaming chariot takes him up into heaven, where I believe he is, because in the Gospels we see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and two people are standing beside him, one on either side. And on one side, the three guys that are witnesses, Peter, James, and John, Jesus' best friends, see Elijah and Moses. So, you know, some of you say, oh, there, no, nobody goes to heaven. Uh, no, that's not true. Moses has gone to heaven. Elijah has gone to heaven. 
We know that for sure because they came back and they were transfigured with Jesus. He was glorified in front of his three disciples. They saw him in his glory. So we know that Elijah's in heaven. He's waiting for the rest of us to listen to God just like he did. To allow God to shape us into what it is that he needs in order to reach into the communities that we live in, the families that we are a part of, the, the country that we so enjoy. He's waiting for us to, to reach into that with the mission that he will send us on, that he is in charge of. And when we do that, I believe that amazing things will happen. Because you see, that's 2 Kings is the story of Elisha. And if you think that the story of Elijah was incredible, just read the life of Elisha. In fact, it came true. He was twice as amazing as Elijah. As, super, as biblical superheroes go, Elisha really, really puts it down. And it is very interesting. So if you want to live that kind of incredible life, I invite you to say yes to the still small voice that comes behind you and says, this is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. I know that, that the Huertas and their family are already, already they are listening. Today was evidence when God says, come, I want, you to, I want you to dedicate your child. I want you to give your child back to me. They said, yes, we want this child to know God. We want this child to walk in his ways. My friends, each of us get a chance to say yes to God and to go on his errands to go on his mission. It's incredible. You don't know what's going to happen this week, but I promise you that if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, amazing things are going to happen this week. So be aware that if you've said yes, it's going to get crazy. Amen.